Welcome to Walking by Faith. Today we'll see how God's grace helps us rise after setbacks and stay on the path He has planned for us. Pastor Dwayne shows how God can turn our past mistakes into opportunities. Let's dive into today's message, Finding Strength in God's Grace. Want to dive deeper into today's message? Download the Walking by Faith app or click on the Beyond the Sermon link in the description. And uh, this morning, I just want to continue really unpacking some thoughts that we've been having about how to reverse the devil's decisions. I think every Christian has heard that God has a plan for your life. And it's really true. Ephesians 2 and 10 says that he has prepared good works for you to do, that he has made ready paths for you to walk in. Listen, living the good life, he prearranged and made ready for you. So often people have the idea that sin is the good life. Sin is not the good life. It's the bad life. The good life is the life that God has prepared for you. In fact, I love what it says about Jesus in Hebrews. It says, because you loved righteousness and you hated unrighteousness, the Lord your God has anointed you with the oil of joy. And and literally, living the good life that God's made for you, following his way, is the life that people are looking for. It's a life full of joy, full of peace. In fact, the Bible says the kingdom of God, it's not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, it's peace, and it is joy in the Holy Ghost. Do you know what people are looking for? They're looking for peace. They're looking for joy. Where is it found? It's in the kingdom. That's where it is. But the devil also has a plan. And Jesus basically gives us his job description in John 10, 10, where he says this, the thief, the devil, he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is his only purpose. His purpose is not so you have fun. His purpose is to kill you. His purpose is to take you to hell. But what we need to do is we need to reverse every decision, every plan the devil has made. So 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, be sober and be vigilant. And by the way, the word vigilant here means pre-planned resistance. Pre-planned resistance. You've made up your mind beforehand, right? I'm not going the devil's way, and you you are planning how you're going to resist him, right? Now, let me just say this. It's easier to keep the devil out than to get him out when he's already in. It's easier to keep him out. And notice that the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Not just anybody, ignorant people, people that cooperate with him, open the door for him. Those are the people that the devil devours. But then verse 9 says, resist him. This is not a suggestion. If you're a Christian, this is a command. Resist him. James said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Literally, run in stark terror. Do you realize the devil is afraid that you will find out who you are in Christ? What belongs to you in Christ? And begin to use the authority that God has given you. When he realizes, if you ever find out who you are, what belongs to you, the authority that you have, his days of manipulating your life are over. 2 Timothy 2, verse 26 says, be sober. Oh, excuse me. I got that one wrong. How does it go? It says that they may escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So what the devil wants to do is he wants you to have a passive will. Got that? That you can escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. When you're doing his will, it's because your will is passive. Right? You cannot be passive as a Christian. So Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. You have got to get violent. You've got to stand against the enemy. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you. I've set before you life 
and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The decisions that you and I make today do not just affect us. He says, when you make that decision, it doesn't just affect you, but it affects the people around you, you and your descendants, you and your family. By the way, there is something better than going to heaven, and that's taking your family with you. And there's something worse than going to hell, and that's taking your friends and your family with you. Your decisions do not just affect you. In Deuteronomy 30, excuse me, 10, verse 13, it says, and to keep his command, the commandments of the Lord, his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Who's good? You're good. People think God is an old fogey. He doesn't want me to have fun. No, he knows you're going to destroy your life. Everything God tells you is for your good. Not for his good. It's for your good. He knows that if you will follow his ways, that you are going to live the best life that you could possibly ever live. So resistance is not a suggestion. It's a command. But so many Christians simply assume everything that happens is the will of God. And everything that happens is not the will of God. Number one, the Bible says God wills that all men repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. How many of you know people slip into eternity without God every day? It's not the will of God. God wants everybody to tithe. Some of you know that isn't working for you. Uh, how can, G, this is what it's, Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good, healing all oppressed of the devil. It wasn't God who brought sickness into the world. Who brought it, sickness into the world? The devil. And Jesus literally came to reverse the works of the devil. The Bible says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of of the devil. But for that to happen in your life, in my life, we've got to cooperate with God. So we've been talking about when you get hit, when you take a hit, don't quit. The Bible says this in Proverbs 24, verse 16, the righteous man may fall seven times and rises again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So when you get knocked down, how many of you know we all get knocked down sometimes? The unrighteous thing to do is to stay down and feel sorry for yourself. Woe is me. I blew it. God will never bless me. God will never use me. God's mad at me. I'm just going to sit here and eat worms. Nobody loves me. That's the unrighteous thing to do. What the righteous do is they get back up. All right? They rise again. The principle is don't quit, don't give up. God is for you, God's with you, God is on your side. So it says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you're going to live an effective Christian life, you need to be strong in grace. Now, here's what grace is. Grace is God doing for you what you do not deserve, what you did not earn, what God does for you in spite of you. How many of you know you have made a mistake in the last month? You sinned in the last month. You know what the devil tells you? You're bad. God's mad at you. God's not going to use you. God's not going to bless you. But do you realize that God has not saved one person who deserved it? He has not healed one person who deserved it? Not one. God has not used one person who was qualified except for Jesus. You know what you need to be strong in? Grace. Grace. That you are saved by grace. That word salvation doesn't just mean die and go to heaven. Right? It means healing, deliverance, preservation. It, it is literally the all-inclusive word in the gospel. 
but it all comes by grace. And it says you need to be strong in grace. If you look at yourself, you will realize you do not qualify. Right? But God qualified you, the Bible says, for your share of the inheritance of the saints in life. Malachi 7, verse 8, do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. We need to be just what this, this prophecy says, that when we fall, we need to remember we are going to arise. You may have never thought about this, but every one of God's days begins with the night. We think about it, you know, it's day and then night. But God thinks night and then day. Genesis 1, verse 5. There was evening and there was morning the first day. What came first? Dark. And then came the light. And it is really a picture of what God wants to do in our life. We may start out dark, but what God wants to do is he wants to bring deliverance, peace, joy, righteousness in the Holy Ghost, and he wants to bring us from darkness into light. I want you to think about this. You cannot even be a Christian without believing in dead raising. Right? Romans 10, verse 9, if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, that's just not something that happened to Jesus. Literally, that is something that God wants to do in our lives. He wants to take us from that place of darkness into a place of light, into a place of defeat, into a place of victory. I want you to think for just a moment about one of the great leaders of our nation, Abraham Lincoln. But I want you to remember how many times he failed. At 22 years of age, he failed in business. At 23... He tried to get involved in politics, but was defeated. He failed. At 24, he failed again in business, went bankrupt. At 25, he was elected to the legislature. At 26, his sweetheart dies. And, and by the time he's 27, he has a total, complete nervous breakdown. He is on suicide watch 24-7. Family and friends 24-7. They're watching him because they're, he's so deep in depression, they believe he's going to take his own life. At 29, he was defeated again for speaker. At 31, he was defeated for the Electoral College. At 34, he was defeated for Congress. At 37, he was elected to Congress, but then he didn't do a very good job because he was defeated at age 39. At age 46, he was defeated for the Senate. At age 47, defeated for vice president. At age 49, defeated for the Senate. And at age 51, elected as president of the United States. But here's the interesting thing. During the Civil War, it was undoubtedly the darkest time that America had ever seen up until that time. And there was defeat after defeat after setback after defeat. But even with all of that, here was a man who was used to defeat and rising again. And God used him to lead our nation through the darkest time that it ever had, right? Now, I, I oversee about 80 churches. And one of the things that I tell pastors again and again, listen, I said, there's three things. If you can do these three things, I said, you'll make it, all right? Number one is love your spouse and nobody else. That's good. Number two, preach the Bible just halfway decent. Just be pretty good, because the Bible's so good, if you're just pretty good, you'll make it. Amen. And then number three, don't quit. Just don't quit. That's all. I, I thought it was interesting. I read a while back that the average pastor who quits, quits because of six negative people, six vocal negative people. I remember when I became pastor, I'd just been pastor a couple months and uh, I was following Pastor Bug, who was uh, older. I thought, used to think he was old. He was 50. He's just a little kid. <laughs> but I was 30. Right? And we had different styles. And we were just a couple months in. Uh, I, I'm, uh, it's after the service, and I'm walking up the middle aisle, and this couple comes up to me. And they, this is what they said. They said, we don't like you. 
We don't like you at all. And we were here when you came, and we'll be here when you're gone. Now, if, if you have congregants like that, you don't even need a devil. <laughs> but you know what I did? I just outlasted all my critics. You know, I've been here 41 years. They're gone. They're gone. Right? Just don't quit. Don't quit. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, now it's not talking to just pastors. It's talking to every Christian. You've been given a ministry. As we have received mercy or grace, we do not lose heart or we do not get discouraged. Don't do it. Don't give in to discouragement. Uh, in Isaiah 54, verse 17, it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So here's what it says, that there's going to be weapons that are going to be formed against you. There's going to be words that are spoken against you. And the Bible says when they show up, you need to condemn them. You condemn them. Somebody says to you, you know, you're getting a little older. Do you realize that your parents and your grandparents, they got diabetes in their 50s? You're probably going to get diabetes too. You know what you need to tell them? No. No, I will not. Proverbs 18, 21, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. The Bible says you need to rise up and condemn. You need to say, no, not to me, you don't. Not to my family, you don't. Not to our health, you don't. You're not taking our health in Jesus' name. They say that it's flu season. They say there's a new epidemic. Not at my house in Jesus' name that you need to condemn it. Every tongue that rises against you, you need to speak against that thing. You need, you need to condemn it. The righteous may fall seven times, but they rise again. When you think about Peter, Peter is one of the closest three apostles to Jesus, but yet on the night he was betrayed, Peter not only denied the Lord, he's calling down curses on himself saying, I don't even know who he is. I want you to get this. 50 days later, it's the day of Pentecost. And he stands up, and this is what he says. He says, you denied the Lord. Well, who else did? Peter did. He denied the Lord. But you know what? He got forgave, forgiven, and he rose up again. And 3,000 people get saved listening to that sermon. David, King David, who was called a man after God's own heart, he commits adultery with Bathsheba and then has her husband murdered by the sword of the Ammonites to cover up that she's pregnant. But do you know what? He repents. And this is what he, what, what he said. He said, you have taken me out of the miry clay and you have put my feet on a solid rock. You know, you may have messed up, but God wants to pick you up and put your feet on a solid rock. And that rock's name is Jesus. So David and Bathsheba, they commit adultery. They're hiding the murder of her husband. But they repent. They get right with God. So Proverbs 6, verse 20 says, My son, keep your father's command." And do not forsake the law of your mother. Now, Solomon is writing this. Who's his father? David. Who's his mother? Bathsheba. All right? This is what they taught him. Proverbs 6, 24. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the seductress, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and the adulteress will prey upon the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not be innocent. Now, who is teaching Solomon this? 
David and Bathsheba, his father and his mother. I want you to get this, that the mess that you're in today may become your ministry. I want you to listen to this. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, in our problems, in our troubles, in our trials, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So here's how this works really practically. If you are suffering from an addiction, right, God will set you free. In his grace, in his mercy, in his truth, in his anointing, will come in your life and set you free. Now, what God wants you to do is take that same comfort, that same truth, and that same anointing that God used on you. God says, I want you to use that with other people. So if you've been set free from an addiction, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to help people that are addicted get set free because the anointing is on you to set them free just like it sets you free. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, Jeannie and I met a couple here in Michigan, in northern Michigan. And uh, we were sitting down with this couple. And, and the, the wife said to me, she, she, and, and Jeannie, those of us that were there, she says, I was an alcoholic. And how many years was it? 20 years? I think it was 20 years that, that she was an alcoholic and became a Christian, still an alcoholic. And she said, what I decided to do is I wanted to seek the Lord, so I went on a 40-day media fast, all right? No social media, no television, nothing, 40 days. She says, and at the end of the 40 days, it seemed like nothing had happened. And I just thought, ah, I'm just going to watch Oprah, all right? So she goes to turn on the television. You know what happens? Jesus shows up in her kitchen and sets her free from alcohol that fast. And the moment I heard that, this is what I said. I said, God is going to use you to set other people free. The, what God has done for you, there is an anointing on you to minister that same thing to other people that have addictions. And I don't know what God has done for you, but whatever he's seen you through by his comfort, by the Holy Spirit, by the anointing, and by his word, whatever he has seen you through, God wants to use you to minister to other people in the exact same situation. So your mess will become your message. And the test that you've gone through, it will become your testimony. God is not going to waste anything that you've been through. But I want you to think about this. God has not had one qualified person working for him yet except Jesus. Not one. And God has not saved one person who deserved it. And he hasn't healed one person who deserves it. So think about this. Next time the devil tries to tell you how bad you have been, I want you to remember that Noah gets drunk. Abraham lied about his wife. He said, she's my sister. And the king takes her and puts her in his harem and is planning some stuff. All right. And God shows up in a dream and stops him. All right. Now, I just want you to know something. That if somebody had the hots for Jeannie and I said, oh, she's my sister, that would not go over good. <laughs> that would not go over. But that's what Abraham did. Think about this. Paul used to kill Christians for a living. That was his living before he gets saved. We've already talked about David, murderer and adulterer. God calls Jonah to go preach, and he runs in the exact opposite direction. God chases him down, and what does God do? Sends him back to do the exact same thing. I want you to listen. The Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. You say, yeah, well, God called me, but I, I just, it's irrevocable. The call of God that was on you is still on you. It is still on you. God found Jonah again, and the exact same thing he had called him to do in the beginning, he calls him again. 
The gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. You may think you've missed your chance. You have not missed your chance. John Mark, he goes on a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, and there begins to be persecution. He hightails it home. And then later, Barnabas says, let's take him with us on the next one. And Paul says, we are not taking that wimp with us. No way. That's sissy. Right? But here's what's interesting. Years later, Paul writes and says, send me John Mark because he's useful to me in the ministry. And John Mark is the author of the gospel of Mark. Now, did he blow it starting out? He blew it big time. But you know what? He rose again. And he rose higher than he had, could have from the, in the beginning. Asaph is David's worship pastor. Wrote Psalms 73 through 83. And he gets discouraged. He just looks at life. And he says, I'm doing everything right. And I have all these problems. But all these wicked people, it seems like they don't have any problems at all. And he gets very discouraged. And he says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you've set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction, and oh, they are brought to desolation. He said, I got so discouraged until I understood the end. How I many of you know sometimes you look at things today and it can look bad? But you look forward, and that's what happened to Asaph. And by the way, Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, who becomes the father of the 12 tribes, he lied, deceived his father, and stole his brother's birthright. But you know what? God still used him. All of Israel, they come to the edge of the promised land, and they all doubt God. They complain, and God has said, go in. But they complain, and they say, we're not able. And, and according to Nehemiah, they actually select a leader and want to go back to Egypt. But you know what? God forgave them and used them anyhow. Uh, Moses killed a man, hit him in the sand, had to run for his life, and was in hiding for 40 years. But you know what? God still used him. Aaron, think about this. He becomes the first high priest. But you know what? He built a golden calf and then lied about it. Moses is up on the mountain. The people say, make us a God. He said, bring me your earrings. The Bible says he fashioned a calf. When Moses came down, this is what he said. Well, you know these people. These people are always trouble. And I, I, just threw the, I just threw the rings in the fire, and the calf jumped out. He lied about it. How many of you know God used him anyway? Yeah, that was pretty bad. Samson, we all know, he fell for Delilah. Joshua made a covenant with the people of the land when God had explicitly told him not to do so. But God used him anyway. Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets, got discouraged and depressed and wanted to quit. This is what he said. He said, oh, that I had in the wilderness or the desert a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them. Huh? I read that and I thought, well, he wants is a hotel in Arizona, the wilderness and a lodging place for travelers. Away from my people. He just says, I just want to get away from these people because there's so much trouble. But you know what? God used him anyway. Lot pitched his tent and finally is living in Sodom. But the Bible still called him righteous Lot. Isaac lied about his wife, just like Abraham did. And if it hadn't been that God intervened, it would have been a catastrophe. Zechariah has the angel Gabriel appear to him and tell him, you're going to have a child. But you know what? He doubted the angel. He didn't believe, but God used him anyway. Joseph was abused by his family. He was lied about, falsely accused of attempted rape, thrown in prison. But you know what? God rescued him and used him anyway. Gideon was afraid to obey God. And so he finally did it at night. And the Bible literally says he did it at night so nobody would see that he was obeying God. 
right? But you know what? God used him anyway. God, Rahab was a prostitute. But you know what? God saved her and God used her anyway. Naomi was a widow. At the bottom of the economic situation of her day. But yet God used her. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs and dressed really weird. But God used him anyway. The disciples fell asleep. They fell asleep when they're supposed to be praying. That's why they're called the disciples. <laughs> but how many of you know God used them anyway? The, listen, the Samaritan woman was divorced five times, and now she's shacking up with somebody. And Jesus, more clearly than any other time, says, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah, and makes her an evangelist. God used her anyway. I don't know what your misfortune is, but whatever it is, God can use you anyway. Right? We, we need to take our misfortune and let us learn compassion. Right? Use it as a time to learn how to lean on God. Right? Receive comfort and provision when we're going through something. Again, God never used anybody who was qualified. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world, which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his sight. If you are foolish, if you are weak, if you are based, if you are like nothing, you qualify. And God says, that's who I'm going to use. Why? That nobody would glory in his presence. That nobody would say, wow, look at me. God saw me and thought, wow, got to have them. <laughs> They're so awesome. No, 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 no. God took your nothing and put his awesome on it. God will take every single, in fact, Ephesians 2.10 says that God has prepared good works for you to do, that he has paths prepared ahead of time for you to walk in. That's every single believer living the good life. He prearranged and made ready for you to live. The devil will always focus on your past and tell you how many things you've done wrong, how long it's been going on, and how you do not qualify. But when the world thinks you don't qualify, God qualifies you. In fact, Colossians says that God the Father has qualified you for your share of the inheritance of the saints in light. God has a plan for every one of us, and the devil will try to disqualify us by getting us to look at our shortcomings, our sins, our past, what we don't have, and what we're not. But God will take every single believer and minister to you in the ministry that he brings into your life by his spirit to comfort you, to strengthen you, to forgive you, to build you up, to anoint you. God says, use that to minister to others. Hey, thank you for the opportunity to share God's word with you today. And today, if you're not where you should be with God, you say, I know I'm not right with God, but I want to be right. I want to be forgiven. I want to be on my way to heaven. I want to pray a prayer with you. And it comes from Romans 10, 13, which says, whosoever, that's you, will call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're going to do, the way the Bible shows us to. And the Bible says, we'll be saved. If you will pray this prayer from your heart, when we say amen, you're going to be right with God. So as you pray this with me, pray it out loud from your heart. Say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. I believe he rose again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I receive Jesus as my King, my Savior, and my Lord, and I'm going to live for him. I thank you. You've heard my prayer. My past is gone. I'm a part of your kingdom today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it, you are right with God. 
Now, I wrote a book to help you keep growing spiritually. In fact, the Bible says God's goal for us is to grow until we become like Christ. And this book will help you grow spiritually. Now, all the information is right there on your screen. You can download a free copy or we'll send you a copy. Uh, please get in contact with us. Congratulations on taking this amazing step with Jesus. We're thrilled for your new journey. If you have questions or want to learn more, our team is here to support you. To get your free copy of Pastor's book, Your New Life, click on the link in the description or download the Walking by Faith app. This book is packed with practical advice for a faith-filled life. Don't miss out. Claim your free copy today. Check out this powerful mini book, Reversing the Devil's Decisions by Pastor Dwayne, packed with biblical wisdom and real life stories to inspire and transform your life. God has an amazing plan for you, full of abundance, while the devil's plan leads to misery. God's incredible love gives you the freedom to choose your path. Dive into this testimony-filled mini book and learn how to walk in victory. To purchase your copy, visit the WBF store at walkingbyfaith.tv. Light a spark of hope. Your generous support fuels Walking by Faith's mission to share God's message globally. Every gift, big or small, ignites hope in lives around the world. To give, click on the giving link in the description below or click on the giving icon in our app. Thank you for your unwavering support in spreading the message of hope and healing through God's word. Remember, no setback is ever final when God's grace is at work in your life. Whatever challenges or mistakes you've encountered, God can use them to fulfill His purpose. If you need prayer or have questions, leave us a comment or click the prayer link below to connect with our prayer team. Thank you for joining us today and may God's wisdom and peace guide you always. 